Okay, kia ora tato everybody. Welcome along. It's lovely to be here. It is, um, it's, it's quite amazing to see... Actually, I'm playing a home game today, I think. I'm going to be talking about a number of different things. And because I've done the roadshow with MPI of, of this, uh, you know, what went ahead here, I decided to change the talk a little bit. And because I used to have 20 minutes to speak, which of course is nowhere near enough for me, I think I might do two and a half hours today, if you don't mind. So I want to talk about our planet biodiversity, biosecurity. I want to talk about things that are to do with education as well. And the reason I want to do that is I want to have public participation in biosecurity. This is what this is about, right? This is what we're going to be talking about. Good. All right. Now, first of all, I've got to, I always start with this stuff. There are so many problems around us, uh, our, our globe, uh, with our primary industries, but with everything else, with our quality of life, the way we live and things like that. And the most important thing that you'll see on this particular slide is that little um, thing on the left here, the, the Stockholm uh, Institute uh, that put down the planetary boundaries, which clearly says that the number one problem in this, uh, in this world is not really climate change or ocean acidification or things like that. No, it's actually our loss of genetic biodiversity, our genetic material, which is really, second one is of course, uh, you know, biogeochemical flows, and the third one is land use. Just saying, this is really to sharpen your mind as to where we are. Here are some other little things that we actually should, um, should look at, and it's the circular economy, which we're very, very much uh, needing, especially in this particular place. We've already talked about composting. Thank you, James. That was good. That was circular economy stuff. I know that you straight away, bang, just like that. And the other thing is growth at all costs, but seeing John Key isn't here, I won't go into that. Um, all right. Well, let's go and talk about biodiversity and biosecurity. Lewis had a go. We are losing stuff, left, right, and center. But the ironic thing is, of course, that biosecurity, with some of the incursions, fills that up again by getting the pollution of our ecological systems with all sorts of unwanted creatures that we don't want. So these are actually two problems. We're losing stuff and we're diluting, we're diluting our ecosystem services and our ecological systems. This is really important. Okay? Very simple. Um, let's get on. I'd like to start off with saying, look, Biophilia, the love of nature, starts at a really, really young age. You think about it, everybody knows exactly what I mean, that you learn the ABC through ape and bear and cat and things like that. That's how you learn to speak at school. We didn't start with wallpaper, with cell phones and cubicles. So, what went wrong in the meantime? We ended up disconnected from nature. And I suppose that is really what this is about. If you want 4.7 million nature literate people in New Zealand who know uh, a creepy crawly which shouldn't be there, uh, then you need to have nature literate folks that look out for these things. And we have just raised, successfully I may hasten to add, the very first generation of kids in total, complete absence of connection with nature. Okay? This is important because this is what we have. When these kids look at their little iPads and go onto Twetbook and things like that, what do they see? <laughs> they see images of Mad Max and things like that. They, they see images without a tree in sight, no green. It's always raining, it's oppressive. It is really, really, really dangerous material if you think about it. There's not a green blade or anywhere. This is really bad stuff. And you want this into a New Zealand context? Very simple. The other side is, they see this sort of crap. Hello, <laughs> hello, hello. Welcome to our world. Disconnect with nature. Remember, we need nature time. We all need nature time. And I've been, I will always keep this slide. We all, not just kids, need nature time. 20 minutes a day at least. Unless you are very, very busy then you need an hour. <laughs> and if you go through the peer-reviewed literature and look at all the benefits of connecting with nature and having nature time, I don't think there's anybody here that is totally surprised by any of these statements on the right-hand side of the slide because this is what nature time does. Okay? So you see how we're working here on biosecurity, nature time, education, all these sort of things. This is what it's about. 
So how do we reconnect with nature? Because that is what I'm advocating to do for our, our, our benefit here. This is the question. So first of all, I've noticed that working up and down the country, that if you start working with communities, and especially the younger generation, you need a couple of things that I believe work really well in practice. And so I'm giving you a couple of scenarios of work that I've been involved with. Very first thing is you need an, a restoration project. Could be anything, planting, whatever it is, uh, killing pests, it doesn't matter. Number two, you need to incorporate citizen science. Thank you, Sir Peter Gluckman. He's doing that too. So it's interesting how we're all working together. And the third thing you need over this whole thing is an environmental, clever and inspiring environmental education system, which is really what this is going to be about and how it's going to work. Mm, let me give you one little example. And the nice thing is, it comes from a project that I'm working with at Cape Kidnappers in Hawke's Bay. It's called Cape to City. Now, we all know where Cape Kidnappers is. Those of you that are not from New Zealand, I'm sorry, it's that little point sticking out in the sea on that Google map. There's the biggest uh, mainland gallant colony. The first one we had in New Zealand is there. It's famous. It's brilliant. But some of the very wealthy owners of that that point, if you like, have put a, 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 a what is it, 11 million, what did it cost, Lou, 11 million bucks or something, that fence? They put a fence around there. There's two species of kiwis, there's two atara, there's, there's all sorts of introduced birds and skinks and, and giant wetas, there's all sorts, there's, it's like a zoo, brilliant, wonderful. And suddenly the Hawke's Bay Regional Council came on board and said, how about if we, well, Andy, Andy Lowe says, if, we, if I would have to replace this fence in 20, 30 years' time, I will have failed. How about working towards that fence breaking down and making sure that everything between the Cape Sanctuary and the three cities of Napier, Hastings and Havelock North will become predator pest-free? Ah, says Maggie, I like that. Predator-free New Zealand 2050 works well. Good, 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 good. So, how are we going to do that? We're going to do that with the community, and we're going to do that with schools, citizen science, and teaching the kids in the 20 schools in the footprint how that works. Those are the pictures. What we're actually doing is, is, is teaching the teachers to teach the kids who now speak in languages like, we're planting our plants, our natives, for when the birds come back. Not if the birds come back, not, you know, in the for when they come back. And those kids go to the parents who are the farmers there and say, have you checked your traps yet? And did you know that your phone got a message from trap number 35 in paddock 3 that it has been set off by a rat? Have you been to that trap yet? So this whole project is run by nagging kids. <laughs> yeah? This is how it works. I want to tell you one little story. You look at the, the bottom line of photographs, the second one from the right. You see all these people standing there around some gannets, right? Some white birds. They're not gannets, they're actually, uh, what do you call it, uh, make-believe gannets, which were made in China. Andy Lowe decided he wanted his own gannet colony. It's a bit of a story, you'd love this. He wants his own gannet colony. So he, got, he went to China, got 32 of these white things with yellow heads, and he put them down on his lovely little flat bit right on his land there, and the gannets would fly around in front of the wind. He goes, oh, there's gannets there. And they go back to their colony up the road. And they would come back the next day and go, oh, they're still there. And they come. And finally, after a couple of weeks, these gannets would fly by and go, you know what? They went up, they go, they shagged the decoys and flew back off again. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> so that's a working project at the moment. <laughs> but that is exactly how this is going to work. And the stories are everywhere. And now look at all the benefits for the landowners. You know, from cleaner water to biocontrol organisms and bee support and you name it. This is all part of that project. It is citizens, it's landowners, it is it's the people that farm there, it is endangered species thriving where we work, live and play. That is Cape the City. Now, I basically can walk off the state because you got it. You got it, basically. But to engage citizens and kids, we need to tell stories of connections. And for that, we need scientists, we need citizens, we need all sorts of people. We, we need iwi too. I'm actually desperate for iwi stories. I'll come back to you in a moment about that. Stories of connection are no better than me showing you the biggest wilding pine species in New Zealand, the Douglas fir. Right? There it is, in its native habitat. 
studied because some little clown found that all these trees in that forest in North America are connected underground by a fungal material, the big F word, Peter, here it is again, the fungal called mycorrhiza. And there were stories of these things not only tr linking each other's up, each other up, like the trees linking, linking themselves up through the fungal mat, but also transmitting food, information, and intelligence to all these members. This is the largest organism on the planet. What is it, 35,000 hectares, six times the weight of a blue whale. You want to talk about connections? Take that to the kids, will you? Because this is real. These are real connections. You start when they're young, three, four, five, six years old, they get it. You end up when they go to tertiary in institutions like EIT, the Eastern Institute of Technology in Napier, in, in, in Terradale. These students, by the way, you see there at the top, are not just any old students of EIT. They're actually teachers that got their teaching diploma. And guess what? In year two, they ran into me. Because I took them out for a week into Cape City, to Cape to City landscape, I let them loose without a compass, those that came back got a certificate. <laughs> yeah, got it? Simple. This is how we work. Because if you want nature literate New Zealanders, you are going to need nature literate teachers. Each one of these places here has got a story to tell, from the Kepler to Taupo to, the, to Taranaki to everywhere. And this is what it is about. It is all based on the teachings, if you like, of Richard Louvre, Sir Ken Robinson, and so on and so forth. And there is now a growing amount of literature of how to work with reconnecting young kids that become nature literate. It's absolutely fabulous. The EIT teaching training is also good because we take them into the forest and make them do art challenges as they are learning in year two. And the Cape to City teachers are going out with us and doing all sorts of projects within the landscape as well. But it's always about the environment as a context for education, not environmental education. That is so old-fashioned. That is so last century. These are flex pods. Each is filled with 85 seeds of flex. Now, in that picture on the left, you'll see one, two, three, four, Ed, so there's numeracy right there. You can go even higher levels and, and, and with statistical uh, ability predict how many flex seeds there are on a whole plant. You can go on and on and on. These are the kids from the Kepler that not only tap into the dock system by catching the seeds of beech trees and thereby predicting a new battle for the birds and a mast here, but they also do, if you like, science and numeracy by making graphs which they call the beech seed red roller coaster. It's not a bloody graph at all, it's a roller coaster. It goes up and down, and that's how nature's patterns are. This is how it works. So that's just numeracy. Then we can go to literacy. I got my wife is a long-suffering English teacher at Burnside High, and she heard me talk to all these, and she says, are you doing teaching these days? She says, yeah, I do, this is what I do. She says, right, I want you in my classroom now. We're going to do stories from nature. The kids are asked to do an whatever it is with some writing about stories, what they got, their experiences from nature. And there's lovely stuff coming. The bottle you see, the second picture on the left, somebody said, I'm going to make a box with a beach scenery. There's a bottle with a message in it, and the message has a poem which describes how the bottle went through the plastic gyre in the oceans, how it went from A to B, climate change, and all that sort of stuff. So the messages in the bottle were one of environmental, if you like, recklessness of our planet. It is amazing. You can do ecology, of course, science, chemistry. When a dog pees onto a plant, what happens? What does the nitrogen do? How do the leaves grow? This sort of stuff. Physics. Oh, the chemist. Our peripetus. We've got 37 species of peripetus, velvet worms in New Zealand. That blue thing on the bottom. It's this big. It's the size of a caterpillar, soft as hell, but a brilliant predator. It walks around, and when it sees prey, it thunder chucks on it like bleh. And that sets within a tenth of a second into the most amazing fast-setting glue. So the prey goes like and it sees the velvet worm coming close, it totally eats the prey and reuses all that glue again into its next, ready for the next one. Circular economy, reuse. The Americans were really interested in it because they were getting sick of tasers. <laughs> the environment as a context for education is no better used than in the word or teachings of biomimicry. 
If you have never heard of biomimicry, man, this is gold. These butterflies are not blue at all. They're brown. They only become blue when the light goes on. And it is because they don't have toxic dyes to make them iridescent blue. Not the, like the toxic dyes in this carpet, which you manufacture from wool, then you put the toxic dyes in and you put them on the floor and you let babies crawl over them. I thought there was a design mistake, really. Anyway, these butterflies are brown and only when the lights go on, the structures on their, on their scales make them blue. This is how it works. We now use that to stop forgery in banknotes, in credit cards, exactly the same technology. This is technology learned from nature. And that brings exactly up what biomimicry is, learning from nature. You want to make the best Kevlar in the world? It comes out of the bum of a spider, which had a few moths, a couple of beetles, a bit of water, where you go. comes out of one of those nozzles, sets as a, as a liquid, sets to a flexible material that shrinks when it's wet and expands when it's dry, the opposite to what wool does, because you don't want there your web hanging on the floor when it rains now, do you? There's a lot of stuff here. There's technology. There's all, you know, all from biomimicry. I love that. And I can, look, look honestly, I can go on until 3 o'clock this afternoon about biomimicry. I won't. You got a problem. I was the one who discovered cluster flies when I was working for MEF in 19. God knows what. That's the thing on the left. What do you do with cluster flies? Somebody rings you up on the radio. Hello? Hello. I've got cluster flies. Congratulations. Uh, well, how do I get rid of You don't. What do I do? Well, this is what you do with them. You get a sharp pencil and you actually make some seriously good art with it. <laughs> Kids get that. There is no doubt about it. They get that. They'll be, you show them this, they're into it. And they will always recognize a cluster fly from now on. So what do we do? We write resources. We write resources for teachers, resources like Mini Beast Challenge. Do your own little mi mi mini blitz, if you like, eco blitz on your school ground. Find out what you've got. You want to go on? I wrote this very piece of paper in a car ride with my teacher of Cape to City. Just what? let's do something about silk and see how it branches off from silk to the animals that make it to the silk route and, and China to dyeing silk to s languages like sun silk and sm smooth and soft and all that. The kuya and the spider, Patricia Grace, that sort of what you get into stuff everywhere. So the word silk suddenly goes into all crevices of the curriculum. We don't need to change the curriculum. We need mind maps and challenges like this. Because a teacher is clever enough to pick this up and literally run with it. Show to the kids what would you like to do. All kids are different. Some kids are like me, ADHD, dyslexic. They want to run around. They want to bloody climb a tree. They don't want to sit there doing maths and statistics. Blow that. They will do an, an, a, a stage show with dance and things like, about silk. Others do their own thing. You see what I mean? So I'm just, I'm just working, look, I'm just working with this. Just work with me now. This is an interesting one. We just had a discussion at the table. Let me give definitions of all these things, exotic, native, endemic, and so let's go there and then find out what is the latest native bird in New Zealand. Thinking that native is something that flew here on its own without any, you know, help at all. Does anybody know, by the way, what the latest native bird in New Zealand is? The glossy ibis, Marlborough. There's a big rookery for the last three years. Yeah, anyway, that sort of stuff. Doesn't matter. There's some more resources. We have one of the best resources in New Zealand. Do not underestimate the value of Nature Watch, which is your MPI eyes and ears on the world. But you knew that already, really, if you think about it. There's LEARNS, which is the virtual field trip filmed for schools with an education context anywhere you want to go. If you've got a mine, we have a LEARNS trip in the mine. If you've got a national, uh, national park track, we'll go there as well. This was the one on the route burn. We can do anything you like. Pohutukawa replanting, uh, restoring wetlands, LEARNS will be there. It's a virtual field trip for three days, live online. And during the day, you can ask whoever goes on that field trip questions, so you actually are there. 
You know what I mean? These are the direct connections. This is lovely. This is another thing. The doc strategy at the moment on education is in full swing, and they are making some seriously good resources that I steal. I do, and I put it on my Dropbox. That's what I do. Um, get your head around ants, for a will, will you, for a moment? And yes, let's have a look at ants, and let's present them in a totally different way. These are not so much the Argentine ants, but whatever. It doesn't matter. Let's get kids to think about how to do this, because you have to then to learn, you have to learn about how they operate and how they communicate and things like that. How about eating Gambusia, which is mosquito fish, sushi? If you think that's funny, they already exist somewhere else. I just got that picture thinking this is great. And if you want a recipe for the second preferred escargot species in France, which is the, the European garden snail, I can give you that too. And I'm doing that with the kids. We collect those snails from the garden. We, we starve them to get their black poopy plops out of the way by feeding them white bread, which then turns the poopy plops white. And then you have white poopy plops, and you know they're clean. And then you can put a pot of water on the boil. You boil them for three minutes, not longer, otherwise they've become like, taste like rubber bands. And then, and then you go to the medicine cupboard, get yourself some forceps, and you take the things out of their shells. It's called the forceps delivery. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> and, and then you fry them for three minutes in garlic butter, and then you put them back in the shell from which they came, because that's called plating up and presentation. And remember, it's Father's Day in three weeks' time. <laughs> this is the stuff I used to do on What Now, on the kids' program, for years, for decades. It's brilliant. It's lovely. And the kids get it. Trapping and surveillance, pheromone traps work most of the times. And going out at night, light trapping, there is nothing better than not going to bed and stuffing around with bugs in the middle of the night around a bright light. How cool is all that? This is what we're going to be doing with the kids. And then you can do the eco blitz, the bio blitz. You take them out into the field, you let them, you know, do work. Identify them and do it all. It's great. It's better than going after Pokemon. I'll tell you that. Pokemon should be turned into finding species, right? I've always said that. But anyway, let's not go there. This, for those of you that want to write really quickly, is my Dropbox. <laughs> I steal shit, I make shit up, and I put it on Dropbox as soon as I can to give it to free to all my teachers right up and down the country. This is really important to do that because these things are really being used by the various people that have to inspire kids. So if you want to inspire kids, you really have to inspire them with something they A, haven't seen before, things that they're in awe of or never knew existed, or stuff that they can actually find right outside their door, or in this case if you live in Costa Rica. But the, the point is, this is what this is about. This is what the bug man does with kids. Once you see this, you realize there's creative writing in here, there's all sorts of stuff in there. Make sense? It's on the Dropbox. Go and have a look. There's the address. And it's all about collaboration. Collaboration with everybody that's in education. Yeah? It's all about teachers that get it. The culture of the school, which is an analogy for the culture of biosecurity, the culture of the industry, GIA, the culture of how we are here all together with multidisciplinary uh, dis uh, areas of expertise and departments, government departments. You need a bit of a budget to train teachers, I suppose, and you need curious kids, which you get anyway. Your, your, in your inspiration comes from outside. There's no big deal about that. And of course, you need a nice place to do all this learning, or to do all this teaching. And the teaching is quite interesting because the teachers don't actually know much about ecology and nature, so they are actually quite reticent of going outside. They don't know what to do. They are not confident. But you can do two things. You can go to a national park, you can go to the Cape Sanctuary, and for that you're going to need a bus with fossil fuels, 49,000 OSH forms, yeah. <laughs> 23,000 permission slips and a very good lawyer that gets you out of the pool if one of the kids breaks an arm. So what did we do with the Mesda Foundation? Imagine building an outdoor classroom on the school ground 
by which the teachers and the kids have got an idea of how they're going to make this, they've got a say in how they're going to uh, build it and what it's going to contain, and you're going to get for $10,000 that forest, that particular habitat, could be a garden, could be anything, on your school ground where you can teach 24-7. It's the cheapest classroom you will ever get. Hekia Parata wouldn't know herself if she reads how cheap they are compared to a prefab. And then in one Saturday morning, we come with the Mesda Foundation and Project Crimson and all other people and the whole community, plant a lot, have a couple of sausages. Oh, and by the way, what I do the day before is talk with the teachers to see this or ex actually give them the resources of how to use this in the future with lots of ideas. And so we tick off school after school after school. Make sense? It's wonderful. That's what it's about. Because there will come a time that our kids become nature literate and will be doing the fruit fly traps. I am not joking. They will. By the way, that specimen is still in my father-in-law's freezer. I must take it back on the next trip. Now, that's true. I found that the other day in, in the Golden Gold Coast. There's a Queensland fruit fly just sitting in the room. I thought, hello, that's easy to have in your luggage, isn't it? Just thought, this just made me think. Anyway, so kids will be nature literate. They will be doing this. They will be. And they will be doing things like, you know, being part of your system. You have to start getting your schools involved because that's how you get your community. Because the kids, of course, talk to the parents and to their grandparents. So there's actually three generations for the price of one. And if you're Dutch, that's quite good. <laughs> kids can then try their hand at trap design. Try that. What sort of trap design can you make? This is what it is about. If you want to put this into a bigger light, I can see kids in the Kaikoura region going to the water and starting the measuring of the return of the, of the power from today onwards, which is a positive project to look forward to, a positive project in the light of everything that happened. They can measure the turbidity, they can count the numbers of new settlers, because these things will come back, there's no doubt about it. Or as somebody said, we can get the kids to think about how creatures get into New Zealand through parcels. Somebody says, why don't we print a whole lot of stickers, send them to their grandmothers who sent the parcels from the UK and Holland and all that, and put on that sticker which says, when you open this, watch for bugs. A big, bright sticker that kids love bright colours, but even adults cannot ignore. These are the sort of little things that you would expect kids to do, and they will. So, nature literacy. Why do we do all this? Well, I've realized after all these years, we are connected to a natural world, whether you like it or not, which is why it makes smart business sense to be connected to it, restore it, look after it, and look after our biodiversity and our biosecurity, because this, this is your country, this is your planet, this is your operating space, this is your home. Thank you.